Hello, good afternoon, welcome uh, to the Science stage, uh, dear creatures outside, uh, out there on your devices. Um, I'm really happy to open our stage to, uh, today. Uh, I'm a bit sad to do it um, all alone here, uh, but no audience. Um, so it's even better that uh, at least for our first talk, uh, we have a uh, pretty full uh, panel um, so uh, with all the seven people uh, here on the stage it would be rather crowded um, but uh, yay internet it's possible to have them all there and uh, still be alone on here um, but there are so many people so I don't want to uh, talk too much about them so they have time to talk themselves so um, welcome to the Xen Lichtung that's the first talk and uh, it's your talk speakers Yeah, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we uh, just lost Mario. So talking about internet, um, <laughs> we're supposed to actually uh, run the session mostly, uh, but I also got the notes here. Um, so let's uh, let's maybe start with uh, what the session is going to be about, and let's hope that Mario will also be joining back in in a bit. So I want to share the story of the PS Lab, that's one of our projects, and our challenges in Corona times. Our goal is to inspire others to create open hardware and to share their stories of how they find solutions to problems and specifically in these Corona times. And in turn, this might help us as well. And welcome back, Mario. I just did the intro because... Thank you very sense. much. So, um, yeah, and um, actually, uh, so uh, Daniel just did the introduction and um, people who are watching this now, they also can see how we basically work. So whenever something's not working or something needs to be fixed, um, this is how we um, collaborate um, with each other. So um, I would like uh, everyone here in this uh, session now to um, yeah give a short introduction of themselves. And then just like how we do in our usual regular meetings uh, of the Pocket Science Lab, um, also uh, nominate the next person. So um, I would like uh, to nominate uh, Daniel Veselek first. Yeah, hello, I'm Daniel. Um, I joined the Pocket Science Lab I don't know, maybe one and a half or two years ago, but also saw it in Singapore a few times at Post Asia and was really excited about it. And personally, I mainly concentrate on how people can use it and work with students to, to test it and did some like musical instrument misuse of the pocket science lab. And I hand over to Alexander. Thank you, Daniel. Uh... So I've been working uh, with the PS Lab team now for uh, about a year and a half, uh, and I mostly work on the software side. Uh, so that means mostly the uh, the Python component, which is uh, a standalone library, which can be used uh, by people who are familiar with, with the Python scripting. And it is also the, the driver layer for the graphical user interface. And I also do some work on the firmware. Um, yeah, I, I originally, originally got interested in, in the PS Lab uh, so during the summer uh, of 2020 when I was uh, furloughed from work and uh, was home bored. And I wanted some, uh, some hardware project to, uh, to think of it. Uh, so I got one. And then that's yeah how I got, got involved with the project. And then I hand over to uh, Padma. Okay, thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. So my name is Padma, and I I've been with the project since uh, my first GSOC in 2017, and ever since I was uh, with the project, mainly working on the hardware and uh, collaborating a bit to Android and the firmware part as well. Uh, yeah, I think I can pass on to uh, Kiwi. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, uh, my name is uh, Kiwi. So um, basically, uh, friends of uh, Force Asia for quite a while. Um, so here in Singapore. So basically, not just a PS Lab, but uh, any kind of uh, hardware production uh, needed from laser cutting. Uh, generally, they will just come to the office, uh, we'll show up, uh, design, troubleshoot, uh, or and redesign again um, until we manage to get the uh, the design and the uh, casing correct. So. So hand over to Wei Da. 
Hi. So uh, yeah, I'm Wei Tat. Uh, I'm 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 currently co-founder of a Fundigo. A, a, a impact co-founding for, uh, for 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 impact businesses. Yeah. So my role in uh, Pocket Science Lab is actually the manufacturing and of course the distributing. I've been dealing with uh, the manufacturing issues, uh, which is which is a headache, especially during the Corona times. Uh, yeah. Correct. So uh, I pass on to Alexandro. Yeah. Thank you, Wethat. Um, hello, I'm Alessandro. I'm background biologist and I joined uh, the Pocket Science Lab uh, uh, as a project, I guess, almost one year ago. I knew um, Mario and Humphuk since a while. I was also to Singapore the, to the Fosasia, you know, Kiwi and everyone. And uh, um, I'm a biologist. And what I want to do is to integrate uh, uh, scientific equipment on the Pocket Science Lab uh, to give this depth uh, and uh, uh, make it useful on the, on the, science, on the scientific field. And um, yeah, that's it. And I give the word the word to Daniel M. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Yeah, I'm uh, another Daniel. And I have uh, known Mario already for, I don't know, four years, so maybe longer. And at some point, he told me about this PS Lab project. And by day, I'm actually a software engineer working mostly on the web. And so I took over a bit the development of the desktop application, which uh, is based on Electron. And that's interfacing with what Alex talked about, uh, the Python interface. That is our driver then. And with that, I hand over to, uh, good question. I think everybody spoke. I hand over back to Mario. Hongfuk um, yet. And uh, yeah, maybe Hongfuk, uh, uh, make you a short introduction if you like. Can All you right. hear me, actually? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the funny thing is I see myself on the screen, but I um, it apparently you don't see me for some reason. But yes, uh, so thank you, everyone. I'm here. Um, I started for Asia organization with Mario back in 2009. Um, so um, what we want to do with the organization, we, we try to improve uh, people's lives um, in Asia and everywhere through sharing open technologies and uh, foster global connections. Um, besides for Asia, I also serve as um, uh, the vice chair of the open source committee at the IEEE and uh, board member of the Open Source Business Alliance and the Open Source Initiative. Um, in the recent year, I started to um, focus on um, Mm, localization, I believe this is um, the way to help us uh, to produce locally and um, uh, solve like some of the global problems. And I'm really happy to be here today. So as a pocket science lab, it coming out of the Fonfors Asia organization. I've been involved um, in the project um, from the start, uh, engaging with the community and try to bring the pocket science lab to education. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Hongfuk. So, um, yeah, I already got a lot of flowers here in the uh, um, in the introductions. Uh, as you can see, guys, I, I'm one of the person here trying to bring everyone together, and I'm always really excited when we achieve to bring um, people from um, like around the world together. So, um, actually, people didn't say where they are from because I, I think in our meetings it's always so normal that uh, we just have these global calls. But I want to tell um, you guys. Here, so we have um, participants from Sri Lanka, like uh, Patmal, uh, We Ted and Kiwi. Um, you guys are in uh, Singapore. Uh, Daniel, um, all, both Daniels are in in Germany. Alessandro is right now in Italy. Alexander is in uh, Sweden, and Tong Fook is um, from Vietnam. Um, so it's really exciting, and um, uh, this is also one goal of our session here. We want to um, share how we work with open hardware, how open hardware can be a, a way to collaborate um, around the globe without having to sign any, any NDAs, and how we solve um, uh, global uh, uh, problems, and what are our ideas, um, how, to, how we as open hardware contributors and how others can um, help to solve the climate change. So before we go, I'd uh, really like to 
tackle that question, I think it is important to share a bit about our background and um, how we came to the point where we are now in the uh, Pocket Science Lab. So um, I would like uh, to start this uh, conversation here today um, by talking a little bit about the history. And um, yeah, I think we can uh, here like uh, uh, maybe start with Patmal. Patmal, um, uh, you have been one of the oldest contributors on this project. Could you share a little bit about your story, how you started to collaborate here in Pocket Science Lab. I mean, like we know that, for example, collaboration on software is happening for a long time already, but hardware, it's somehow more challenging. So how did you get started and how was it actually that we um, achieved to collaborate on hardware manufacturing? Yeah, maybe I can tell how I started with, with the Space Lab project in the first place. Uh, in 2017, when I was an undergraduate, I, I was looking into this Google Summer of Code program. And uh, I was going through organizations and found uh, Forsage as one of the credible organizations to join and work with. At first, uh, this GSOC is, a, is more like a software-based uh, program where it does not, it does not uh, facilitate much of hardware things. So as a result, uh, there was this XPICE project which was in the community for a while, but it, it was kind of uh, uh, slow going. So we, so in uh, the Force Asia took it over and then we tried to bring it to a level that we can uh, mass produce it and make it more user friendly with a lot of applications that people can in interface this hardware with. And as a result, I got into this uh, PSLab Android project, which is software, so, so it, it also in line with this GSOC project. So I uh, joined this uh, Google Summer of Code project for about three months. And once the once this period is over, and Mario and Hongkuk, we were discussing how to proceed further uh, outside this GSOC program because it was a software software uh, software program. So then uh, I was doing my internship at Singapore. So Mario and we that I think there are a couple of lot of lot of people from this call were in Singapore at that time. So we got together and we we had we had this uh, maker space in Singapore. We we joined there and we discussed how to progress and we designed the first prototype. And from that, we after doing many peer reviews, we we developed the version that that is currently on the market. And that's how we started and where we are heading around. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think we don't have too much time to actually go into all the features and uh, what the Pocket Science Lab can do. Uh, definitely check out this uh, website, pslab.io. And um, yeah, you can definitely uh, also produce it yourself or um, check a few stores on the internet um, if you want to order this. So this is completely open hardware. You can um, uh, make all kinds of experiments with it. You can even control simple robots with it up to Four servos are supported, um, and uh, any sensor that has I squared C standard can be supported. If there's any glitch, um, just open an issue in our repositories, and um, they're all linked uh, on the website. But like we want to talk this time more about um, the story how we produce the open hardware. And uh, Padmal, you already shared how we made the uh, how you made the prototypes. So. Basically, you work on the code, you use like open source programs like uh, KiCad, right? And then you, um, uh, um, how did you get the prototypes actually produced? Well, I uh, I would say for a, uh, for a general purpose prototype, one would try to ask some of the manufacturers, usually in China, to do the prototyping, uh, usually the assembly, assembly part as well. but. Here we thought it would be more more efficient if we do it ourselves. It would save us some time and effort. So I remember we we were doing like uh, three or four prototypes before we get to what we have right now, and all these were done by uh, manual soldering, usually SMT. Um, yeah. 
Well, quite quite a lot of work, but uh, we are also very lucky that we had Padma because the components are so small. I think not many people were able to solder them, but uh, we were sitting down in the hackerspace in Singapore and uh, yeah, together and like I yeah supported Padma uh, with my thoughts, with my mind because they were so small I couldn't have done it. And um, but then was the question: we We're pretty happy with the outcome, and the big question was how can we produce them? And um, um, I think we could never have done it without Wheathead. Wheathead, would you like to share a bit about the story, how um, it came to the production and what were the challenges? All right. Okay. The production wasn't easy, definitely. Right. We had a lot of challenges, things like uh, language. We have things like the uh, uh, quality assurance things, all these things coming uh, that's, that's totally new to us, right? So especially as a as we we this is our first time producing. So naturally, how do we, we first thing we think was how do we actually reach out to the, the people in China, the the manufacturers in China, right? So we actually looked through a few uh, websites, and of course Alibaba was one of the the first few that came out, right? So the Alibaba was actually brought us a few quotes of different components and stuff. Initially, we were thinking about. Uh, procuring the parts ourselves and finding manufacturing ourselves but luckily we actually found a uh, very nice uh, distributor who actually connected us with one of their uh, long-term partners who actually also does the manufacturing of the uh, circuit boards as well so uh, a lot of two and back uh, uh, and, and just nice it hit the chinese new year period and oh uh, during this entire period of time especially in china they had actually one month long of holidays so we actually had to rush rush uh the the production rush the revision rush the schematics uh, and we rush a lot of things just to just to make it happen yeah and of course uh, uh, this involves going going down to the factory itself to make sure that the things uh, are properly in place the quality assurance the quality checks and and, and of course and, and all this stuff as well yeah uh one of the problems that we actually faced while we were trying to uh, source the components ourselves was uh, we met some of the f uh, some of the distributors actually s selling those second-hand components, which uh, actually will overall bring down the quality of the uh, uh, PCB seal, uh, bring the bring down in terms of what we are saying things like uh, you, uh, there's a higher rate of uh, failure, or uh, we uh, there will be higher rate of uh, manufacturing. Uh, uh, being uh, uh, disposed out as well, yeah. So, uh, how is this process actually changed now during the Corona crisis? Uh, more or less, things are still the same. Uh, luckily for our distributor, they are still there. They are they are not closed down yet. Yeah. So that's the fortunate part. Uh, uh, things definitely has become more expensive. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, supply chain, things are getting stuck at different ports. Uh, the uh, you know uh, factory shutting down, people getting uh, quarantine, uh, factories uh, workers and things like that. So uh, because of all these issues, the cost, the turnaround time actually went up. Uh, when we talk about turnaround time, we are talking about uh, components that we might actually wait for. Uh, say uh, uh, what could have been out there, three uh, we could have gotten the components in three months, uh, required maybe till the end of next year. Uh, maybe not even end of next year. We're talking about three years later that the, the, the next available components are available as well. So this 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 uh, this results in some of the distributors, uh, not just China, probably around the world as well, to start hoarding on those components that are very, uh, uh, say, crucial, uh, that are more commonly used, which resulted in the prices going up, sky hoarding we talked about. Uh, one of the chips, the MCP chips that we are using, um, it could be actually just be a few, uh, $1, it's actually about $6 now. So that's actually a, quite a huge jump. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, the, the rest of the challenges still stay the same, finding a, a partner who you really can work with and, and, and all these things are, are pretty much some of the things that we still need, we need to set across uh, while when we are doing the produ production. 
And uh, while we have that idea um, about local production, I think Kiwi will talk soon about it uh, a little bit more in detail. Um, we are not there yet. I mean, our batches are relatively small. I mean, the industry produces hundreds of thousands of batches. We are producing a, a thousand, uh, yeah, in these kind of numbers. Um, so, um, uh, we're still doing the production now in, in China. And uh, so what are the challenges when talking with the Chinese people? I know I know. at the beginning we tried to talk to them in English and uh, then we, we switched to Chinese. Can you uh, tell a bit more about that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So so uh, through Alib on, on Alibaba platform, right, we actually, we are only allowed to converse in English, purely English. So any Mandarin was actually flagged up. So this was Alibaba was meant to be built for, for international buyers, right? So the, they don't want the, the native speakers uh, from China to, to start going uh, to around in Alibaba, you know, and jacking up prices and things like that. So everything was in English. So naturally after that, uh, and uh, they took it offline. Uh, we, uh, everything was through Gmail, was through WeChat. Uh, it was still in English as well, right? So uh, up, to, up to a certain point where we feel that uh, information was lost uh, during the communication. So that's uh, where, where we started, start to converse in, in, in Mandarin, you know. Uh, luckily in Singapore, we actually, most of us actually are able to uh, communicate uh, are bilingual. So it's English, it's an, an, another language. So, so for me, it's of course Mandarin, right? So uh, I communicated with them with, with Mandarin. And of course, they get it. Back, they get it. They get the idea across. And and of course, uh, uh, when you are able to converse in Mandarin, their service towards uh, their service towards us also became better because they understand that uh, uh, we could also communicate with other distributors or manufacturers or or, 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 or uh, in China as well. You know, to compare the quality. So naturally the quality uh, of, of their service became better. Yeah. But uh, after, and, 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 and because of the, the able to converse in, in Mandarin, of course, they were able to, 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 to show us more stuff. They even did a free uh, checks on the schematics for us to make, ensure that it doesn't hit, hit any production issues. Yeah. Cool. And um, yeah, uh, but as you said, things have changed a bit. I mean, um, our um, advantage is that we have um, the established connection already and we understand the process much better. I mean, like, actually, it's pretty straightforward, the process. But when you do it the first time, when you produce the first time, you're not sure, right? Is it like this or is it like this? Uh, will we get cheated? And, uh, and we also, um, yeah, for us, it was quite a substantial investment. Um, like uh, we started a, a commercial operation because as a community, you cannot just produce um, a pocket science lab. Um, but we achieved to do it. And we had some insights from you, WeChat, but now we have Corona time. So how uh, could we do it in Corona times when there are component uh, shortages? Um, how did we work it out? And uh, yeah, Padma, you were the center of the hardware prototyping of the new version, um, which uh, comes with a few uh, cool features. So we are supporting more and more um, robot uh, functions. And um, we have added an SD card. We added a small battery, um, more Wi-Fi, Bluetooth uh, features, um, pins for more experiments. So it's it's like a, kind of a new product even. Um, so, um, um, yeah, a lot of new components were added, uh, a battery and so on. And uh, we needed to make new prototypes. So, Padmal, how did this work out? How how were you able to um, yeah get the prototypes together? Yeah. Okay, so Padma dropped out of the uh, uh, thing, uh, connection to uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, ah, Padma, you are back. Um, can you hear? Yeah, so how, how did it work out? How were you able to produce the new prototypes now in Corona times? But maybe shaky connection. But I think yeah. we were also there, the, uh, uh, the other people, right? I mean, um, so, yeah. so maybe uh, Daniel, because you also were part of that discussion, Daniel Maslowski, uh, uh, a little bit. How, how did that work out with the prototypes? Do you remember how we tried to, to figure this out? I think I'm back. Ah, okay. So then go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So 
I remember when we were doing prototypes, we, we usually uh, make a couple devices, say three or four, and then we distribute among ourselves. And then we test this. And uh, while we are using it, we, we feel like, okay, now uh, one might find this feature useful and we, we try to uh, put that feature in this, in this new board. And so we, we get a new prototype. So we, uh, we went a couple of times and I think we had two or three, three of these improvements. So that's, that's how we got this uh, SD card, this uh, real-time clock, and uh, a battery management system, and new ICs for existing ones. And uh, then comes the corona, and along with it came this uh, chip shortage worldwide. So, uh, but uh, for most of the chips, they, they were having a very long lead time some some parts might not not be even available for about a couple more years so but we couldn't wait until these parts become available so as a solution what we try to do is we we salvage some components from old pcbs and we soldered them and tried to just uh, have this proof of concept ready so that then when 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 the components are ready, we can just go directly to mass production. And that's how we tackle that problem. Yes, and uh, our big question was, uh, how could we do that in the future? Also, when we have maybe components that aren't available, um, what if supply chains are uh, like more and more disrupted? Um, so, um, um, yeah, and then we had the great uh, connection here to Daniel Vasilek, um, who worked uh, also and supported us in uh, the Open Next project, um, which was funded um, um, by U Horizon 2020. Um, and Daniel, um, we took an idea that uh, Kiwi had told us like years ago already with the local production. Um, so um, how um, do you uh, think like that idea could apply, for example, for us in future even more? Um, could you um, explain a bit about decentralized local production and how it could benefit us? And uh, what is the idea, for example, with the cooperation that we try to start with the um, uh, University of Applied Science here in Berlin? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I was just uh, just had another thought, but I don't know if this is technically possible, like to have like parametric keycap files, basically, so that you have a list of components for each part basically and then reroutes the things or something but this was just something uh, along the lines where i was wondering how to how to possibly solve this but like it's very great that we have this connection to the bht berlin hochschule für technik um, and they have a long tradition in making pcbs so they have all the chemicals and a lot of like tools to make pcbs but also like pick and place machines um so we were already in the process of starting to getting this running. And it's, of course, like machines that uh, have been sponsored by industry, for example. So they were running in production for a while, but no one has ever used them in the new location. So so then there came the chip shortage and, and everything got delayed a bit. But in general, I think, especially for bigger things and open hardware can be like electronics, but it can also be furniture and all different kinds of uh, objects. Their local production makes even more of a difference because if you just share the plans and the ways and the processes and the production possibilities, and then you source your products and the uh, machines locally and you can like just get your i don't know your shelf system that's exactly fitted to your space from your city and and everything happens there of course you have a lot of less transportation and so i think it's a strong case especially for bigger open hardware projects and back to electronics i think we got so used to just sending off the files to china and shortly after getting everything chipped back and everything was working perfectly and then there was like uh this ship ever given and suddenly nothing was moving anymore and then there was corona and so on so i think there's more of a realization that it would be good to have this to not lose the skills and the and the possibilities even though it might be more expensive to produce 
there directly, for example, here in Germany, but, but it would be smart to get better at that and not to replace the possibilities of producing globally, but to add to the to the ways of doing it. And especially for smaller badges, I think it's super great if you're able to go through all these steps and it's also for the students great to, to learn. <laughs> So, and uh, um, we have talked a lot about what are our challenges in the production, um, but the question is also um, how a, um, a different way of producing can, for example, help us to save energy, help us um, in the fight against uh, uh, climate change. And uh, we have Kiwi here who is uh, based in Singapore and works with the, um, yeah, Laser Cutter Project with a Laser Cutter Project and his company Lions Forge. Um, and um, yeah, Kiwi helped us to produce these casings in the Pocket Science Lab. Um, for example, here with uh, laser cuts and with uh, yeah, files that we posted then um, on our repositories. So, Kiwi, could you tell us a bit about the advantages of local production and what advantages um, does Open Hardware have here? Yep. Uh, thank you, Mario, uh, for giving me this time to uh, share on this uh, subject. Um, so uh, this uh, local production, um, but uh, I will change the terminology uh, just for myself. Uh, I will call it community production. So, um, so I've been talking about community production since uh, we first met with Mario of Force Asia. Uh, so I'm a strong believer that uh, not just about um, resilience uh, for the community, uh, but also looking at sustainability. Uh, the reason, uh, just give you one quick example. So a lot of the uh, PS lab casing that uh, we made uh, as a prototype, we're actually using whatever material that we can find uh, in the office. So we'll just come in and say, hey, guys, we want to make a prototype. Uh, I have some material here or there, we we'll just take it, we we'll just recycle, uh, and then here we are. Uh, manage to come up with uh, functional prototypes. And this will also be applied uh, to a lot of other projects, especially during COVID-19. So if I may, I'll just share with you some uh, presentation. Uh, it just happened that I have uh, given another uh, uh, session, but again, from this picture, if you can see, uh, so, Again, local production, especially um, or community production during the time of crisis when everything come to a standstill, um, but critical, de uh, critical supplies such as medical device uh, cannot be uh, assessed in other ways other than fabricating yourself. So just imagine if the school is to, do, is to open up and allows the community to come in and fabricate, like uh, convert the school's resources into like a factory to produce like ventilator, face masks, uh, you name it. Uh, just to draw something that I have done. Um, so, uh, uh, let me just put this all right. Okay, so uh, when the, um, what happened here that when the COVID-19 uh, hit us back in 2020 March, uh, Singapore was, uh, go straight into a lockdown. Um, so the, and we all know that from China side, uh, the shipment of masks, face shoes, was totally not available. Um, so what happened then is that uh, we quickly uh, get uh, with the community to kind of like, uh, whoever have 3D, those who have 3D printer will use their 3D printer, those with laser cutter like myself, I will just uh, build what we call a face shield production jig, right? So using laser cutter, we produce this jig, we distribute about one, uh, 100 of these jigs uh, to 100 volunteers, each of them, within a day can produce a hundred pieces of face shoes. So as a result, uh, we are able to kind of gather the community, uh, come together, distribute the face shoes, uh, which you can see uh, down here to the, uh, what I call the frontline workers or people who are uh, in uh, what I call it as a disadvantage. So this is at the high risk uh, area. So whether, whether they are selling food or whether they are, uh, uh, working in the hospital. So these are some of the examples. All right. Okay, so going back. So the um, uh, so these are just a very minor, uh, small examples, but you can see that if this process of having the community able to produce your own goods using the resources you have within the vicinities. Uh, so it's not just about uh, 
not being threatened by China. It's also the ability now that uh, uh, COVID-19 or the pandemic is going to be the new norm. So you never know when will be the next lockdown, right? So it's better for the community to be more prepared. And as we move towards climate change, so let's just talk about a bit on uh, the energy efficiency and the material efficiency uh, perspective. Uh, so put aside COVID-19, so you talk about energy efficiency. So using your own um, material uh, that you can find uh, that it put otherwise been thrown uh, as a landfill or being burned away as uh, as waste. So now you can use it for better good. I think from that perspective, you can reduce a lot of waste. And moreover, able to produce your own goods versus order it from China, ship all the way to here. The amount of carbon footprints uh, produced by whether it's from the aircraft or from the shipping industry and the truck logistic, uh, those will take out a lot of energy. So in a way, you are reducing waste and at the same time, you are reducing the amount of carbon footprint per product. Uh, so from that perspective, I think uh, open hardware uh, comes in when we move away on not just the material, but also the design of electronics. So if in the future, uh, all electronics are more or less a standard template, uh, then strictly speaking, I can just unplug one component's electronics and apply it into another uh, electronics. So right now, obviously, for the purpose of education, like Arduino, so they are already doing that. But what I'm saying is that can we move that open architecture, that intercompatibility beyond just education? Can we move it into the industry? Right? Can we convince the industry to do that? So what, assuming your, 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 uh, when people start to buy EV car, they start to trash away their EV car, can we take the same parts and then apply it to your washing machine, apply it to, your, uh, to other products you want to design? Right, hand back to you, Mario. <laughs> I think I talk yeah, too much. Uh, wow, no, I'm just amazed. Uh, um, you're drawing a very big vision. And I think um, these are the times where we need uh, such big visions um, to change the way really the industry works. And uh, we want to be examples. We want to give examples how this can really work. And um, I would like to ask again, Daniel Veselek, in regards to a resilient and sustainable society now that uh, Kiwi mentioned, um, you um, are also a, a scientist, like a, a researcher. Um, what advantages do you see um, um, as open hardware, um, like going along the way that uh, was uh, what Kiwi mentioned um, as, he, um, as he's doing it um, in a practical way? What opportunities do you see? Yeah, like, like I, I was very happy that uh, this computer magazine CT uh, published something on open source hardware. I think it's blurry now because of the filter. But um, basically, I think I think this DIY approach is one side of the picture. So like using what you have and so on. But and I think it's a big one. But at the same time, I think also being able to like open your devices and so on, like uh, right to repair has gotten a big push in Germany now because we have a new government now and they have it within their agenda to to foster this 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 approach so so for me it would be already really great if like every device that I have like laying around especially the bigger ones if I can like open it up repair it um, like exchange with other people that might also uh, know what constantly goes wrong and so on so like so I think there's a lot of it would be super great to have mostly open hardware simply in my surrounding because because it would make it all a lot easier and maybe one could also like it's also easier than to if someone has a broken device or a device that they don't want to use anymore to really use this directly in order to exchange parts and so on so so the more modular things are as we were just explaining uh the better and I wonder like like what one can do because I, I feel like there is some more motion now like like we had a peak 10 years ago also so but I think now it becomes more and more of a topic to push open hardware also on a political level so so I want to see more products and I want to see them everywhere <laughs> basically <laughs> in the kitchen and in the living room and like so so and for me like like if they are comparable devices, like 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 I would opt for the for the open ones, of course, because because it's a big advantage, basically. 
Um, you, you talked about extensibility, and uh, we have Alessandro here. Um, so in the uh, Pocket Science Lab project, we can support um, potentially any sensor that supports um, I squared C, um, this uh, standard supported by a lot of sensors. Um, we have Circuit Python implemented. Um, we are working with SIGROC. So, um, and we have Alessandro here. Alessandro, you're working on a kind of extension or a component that can work together with the Pocket Science Lab. It is the open spectrometer. And I think this is a very good example, not just of how hardware extensibility um, uh, can work, but also how we collaborate collaborate in the project. Please tell us a bit more about the open spectrometer and what you can do with it in the future. Yes. <laughs> so uh, for the first about the first question, uh, what I envision is this open source hardware uh, reaching out uh, also the laboratory, the scientific laboratories. And because there is such a need of standardization, um, the open source movement is would uh, uh, would really support uh, scientific activities and uh, in in the sense of uh, reproducibility of experiments uh, and equipment and uh, like uh, Kiwi was saying it would be great to have a community um, capacity of building such equipment because uh, you could empower uh, communities that uh, are hard to reach where they where the where the parts are not easy to, to be found and yes by standardizing the construction of this uh, equipment this piece of equipment uh, we could empower more people to do science and to make analysis and to start and to be able to study the the world and the problems around the, themselves about the spectrometer the spectrophotometer uh, this is a tool that uh, uh, tells you what's uh, in your sample, so which com chemical compound is in your sample and how much of it there is. This is a very common technique used uh, in biology, biology laboratories and uh, uh, it, it can let you do very, so a lot of uh, uh, different assays, so uh, tests. And uh, <laughs> yes, uh, we are seeing, we're having some troubles because when you attach, so, so we have a really powerful sensor and uh, there are some, we are seeing that it's not so easy to to connect it uh, with the Pocket Science Lab, but we are positive because through this experience, we are really um, seeing what's the potential and how to go beyond the, uh, the actual capacity of Pocket Science Lab. So I'm really positive about this uh, experience and uh, I'm really looking forward to see when this will, uh, this tool with uh, this device will actually work, and uh, starting with some workshops to teach uh, about uh, uh, more complex scientific experiments to, to to people, so already to young people, so that they can uh, proceed faster in the life science careers. And yes, I think that's a <laughs> that's a quick summary. Of the I, whole I always find it very uh, exciting when I come to your top lab and we talk about this and we try out the first prototypes of the open spectrometer and you tell me what you can do with a spectrometer. Because, for example, you can go into the uh, supermarket and uh, um, uh, check out fruits and so on. Could you give us a little bit yeah. more, a few more examples? Okay, yes. Uh, so the practical applications uh, that we envisioned is uh, to check uh, so it works by checking the color, analyzing the rainbows of the uh, chemicals. So you you uh, throw some light at a, at a substance and uh, it reflects a color, which is what we see. And <laughs> yes, I'm family and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it reflects a color. And if you split uh, this color into a rainbow, uh, you can uh, uh, check how much of each uh, uh, tone of color there is and each uh, chemical has a has a known uh, pattern and through this you can tell uh, how much uh, nutrients micronutrients are in your uh, fruit in the fruit or vegetable that you're buying how ripe they are and then you can make a study to check uh, how nutritious is a uh, uh, a food uh, so, so a vegetable or a fruit according to its uh, ripening status and then uh, you can check uh, uh, 
what's not ratios to you? Or uh, if you have uh, some really fine uh, spectroscopic uh, method, you can also tell if the water is contaminated and uh, what's in the water. So which uh, which contaminant is it? And uh, track it back uh, through knowledge to, to the source. So if there is a contaminant in a river, you can check if it's metal, which metal or uh, chemical dye, and you can track it back to the source, uh, so to the industry, which is releasing that into the uh, waters. Uh, these are kind of applications. Uh, this tool, so a simple version of this uh, is used uh, in the lab to quantify, for example, results of PCR tests, which is the one that we use uh, to check uh, the gold standard to check the coronavirus, for example, the COVID-19. Uh, so they are co called uh, uh, QPCRs, so real time, and there is a, a different type of uh, of. Uh, of machine and uh, there are, there it has these kind of spectrometers integrated, so it works with light. So there is a lot of very a lot of applications and uh, uh, yeah, maybe the <laughs> hopefully we will see something soon yeah. in the next in the coming year. Working. Yeah, I, I could imagine like all these kids they're doing uh, um, uh, Jugend forscht, yeah, um, these kind of uh, things where they, where they go out in the supermarket test what is really true. Is it really true what's written on the product description? Is it really olive oil? Um, are these <laughs> oh. products are really from that country and so on? Like right, trying to find out all kinds of things with um, the uh, open spectrometer. So that would be so cool because um, we <laughs> of course also want to lower the price. Not these expensive spectrometers that are available, but good quality spectrometers for below 200 euros or in future even below uh, 100 euros. So that would be really amazing. Thank you very much, yeah, Alexander, for giving a few insights here. And you should definitely give a talk on the entire thing because <laughs> it's such a big topic. Thank you. Okay, and and, and we are we don't have like many hours, but we have a few more minutes, I think. And um, um, I would also like to talk a bit about like um, how we overcame this Corona crisis by focusing on different topics, making um, the uh, PS lab more extensible by focusing on um, software components. And we have Alex Bessmann here from um, Sweden who um, also joined the project like uh, I think a couple of years ago. And uh, Alex, could you talk to us a little bit more about what has been the progress, um, for example, in the area of circuit Python of uh, um, working uh, uh, on plugging in our uh, libraries into SIGROG. Um, maybe not everyone knows what is SIGROG, um, but yeah, it would be great if you could share a little bit about the work that has been done here during the crisis and over how we overcame these challenging times. Absolutely. Uh, so we have talked already a bit about uh, the extensibility potential of the PS Lab. Uh, so any sensor that that uh, talks over any of the protocols, I squared C, SPI, uh, or UART, can theoretically be made to work with the PS Lab. Uh, but each of those, uh, every such sensor, every such such device, uh, would need to have its own driver written, uh, basically. But there's already a lot of drivers written out there uh, with suitable licenses uh, for a lot of sensors and a lot of devices. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of these drivers are implemented in CircuitPython. So we wanted to see if there was a way that we could reuse these drivers instead of making our own. Uh, so we had a GSOC project on that uh, this past summer, and uh, it was uh, quite successful. And After after that GSOC project uh, was merged, uh, the PS Lab can now use any sensor that has an existing driver uh, written in Circuit Python with minimal work. It takes a, a few lines of code uh, to glue it all together, but uh, uh, there's no need to, to re-implement the entire driver anymore. So that's uh, a big success, I think. And, and the other project that, that you mentioned, Mario, is SIGROC. So SIGROC is a, an existing mature uh, application and library for interfacing with uh, a number of sensors and, and, and instruments, like oscilloscopes and, and uh, uh, logic analyzers and, uh, and other devices. Um, and so we wanted to, to see if we could uh, use SIGROC uh, and integrate it with, with the PS Lab. Uh, and the, 
reason we wanted to do that was because two reasons mainly. Sigrock provides support for it supports both uh, PC of course, uh, but also Android, as does the PS Lab. But the PS Lab's Android and, and desktop support are currently implemented in two completely parallel driver stacks. One is written in Java for Android, and the other is written in Python for PC. Uh, so any any work on the driver has to be done twice. So if we could instead replace the drivers with with uh, Sigrock, then we could do it in only one place, which would be uh, beneficial for us. Uh, in addition to that, the Sigrock project also supports a number of features that we would like to have but don't have yet. So if we were successful in, in integrating Sigrock, then we would get those basically for free. Uh, that work is not done yet, but uh, it's it's ongoing. We currently have some uh, communication issues with, with upstream, but I think that's out of scope uh, for, for this talk. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's about it for, for that. Yeah, um, thank you very much. And um, these are the technical aspects, um, and it's great to see that progress. Um, I would also like to get your opinion about the PS Lab and the topic of climate change. So practically, um, we have heard about open hardware. It can be uh, more sustainable in regards to the production, um, to the logistics, the delivery process, um, as well as the repairability, um, I would say. Um, but what are the use cases now of our open hardware? hardware project here, where the, where can the PS lab be used um, as a solution um, to um, technology development or to hold climate change? Could you think of any uh, potential um, experiments or, or processes um, where it could be useful? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one, one thing that you can do with the PS lab uh, already uh, is you can measure uh, such things as uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere. Just as an example, that's uh, relevant to, uh, to climate change. Uh, so being able to to understand the world around you is uh, essential, I would say, to to uh, halt climate change. Uh, so being able to, I'm having some, I'm hearing something from someone else right now. I'm having some trouble. Yeah, me too. Maybe from from backstage or something. Uh, no problem. I, I muted them. I hope it's okay. All right. Thank you. No, nope, still hearing them. Uh, okay, so I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I don't have the rights. Yeah, we, we understand something. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think it's okay for me. Are there are there some questions from 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 the audience that we can switch to? Um, I haven't seen any questions uh, posted. There's, there's um, one question or, um, on the pad. I found one question in the um, pad. Right now I see four or four not found. So maybe the pad is getting restarted. I don't know. Felix has one. one yes. second. Uh, ah, okay. I, I found uh, the, the pad and it's still working. And the question uh, that I found there is, um, where can people find out more about this uh, amazing project? So they're asking for a, a link or uh, something uh, to find out more. Yeah. Okay, so the, the link is pslab.io. You can just uh, check it out. Please. And um, yeah, exactly. And uh, um, we are uh, coming to the end of this meeting. As you see, like, I'm, I'm, I feel a bit bad because like Hong Fook uh, didn't have the chance to, to talk about like how we uh, make community efforts. And Daniel um, also uh, didn't talk so much, but like, uh, I think we have a couple of minutes uh, left. So, um, Alex, the experiments, what can yeah. we do? Uh, so, like I was saying, uh, the PS Lab is basically, uh, it allows for uh, citizen science. Uh, so, anyone with a, with a PS Lab device uh, can, 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 can do a lot of, a lot of measurements uh, to learn more about the world around them. Uh, and, and through that, you know, uh, I, 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 I struggle to find any, to come up with any, with any like specific uh, ways to solve to solve climate change uh, through that because it's such a it's such a, an enormous an enormous challenge, enormous topic. But but just by understanding 
just by learning more uh, yourself uh, is, I think, an essential step, uh, which the PS Lab and, and other open hardware projects like it uh, enable. Yeah, absolutely. So we need to understand the world around us in order to um, yeah, solve the problems around us. Um, I understand. Thank you very much, Alex. And um, yeah, we have uh, um, like a um, little bit left and um, I would like to ask Daniel and Hong Fook um, to conclude this session. Uh, Daniel, for example, is working hard. Uh, Daniel Maslowski is working hard on the uh, desktop app um, and Hong Fook uh, brings the community together. So I'd like to invite both of you um, for the final conversation to wrap up um, this uh, yeah, great get together. Um, we also just saw the website. Thank you very much, Felix, for showing the website. You saw their pictures also of other contributors and uh, yeah thank you very much for everyone so Hongfok, daniel would you like to use these final minutes for uh, yeah sharing a bit about the community and the development and how people can contribute maybe yes, uh, sure so um um yeah so um i don't want first of all i don't want to say that uh, i'm so grateful to be here to be involved in the project and to be among um uh you the people the uh, like not only my friends but the people who uh, give me a lot of um energy a lot of um inspiration to to continue what i'm doing in the community so i want to to second what alex said just now so climate change is a huge topic and it cannot be tackled by just a small group of people we need everyone to involve and the conversation we are having right now is an example of how bigger problem can be solved by um like sharing of technology sharing um, of uh, so called of resources, and uh, I think I don't need to emphasize the example here anymore. A kiwi in Daniel uh, Vesselek already mentioned, or Alessandro, there's so many applications around. Uh, that we can um, reference to, but I want to, to make a call for the people out there that we need more people, we need more believers on like the, uh, the right to prepare open source hardware can change something and we need to join together in the movement, uh, in this movement. Um, so Daniel uh, Malowski, I, I, I'm going to pass it over to him. I just want to say that I, I know Daniel for several years also through the open source community and, and never stopped like surprised uh, by all the, the work that he's done so far and continuously um, supporting the project and um, uh, it's great to, 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 to see so many people uh, despite of uh, difficulty during COVID uh, we, we know that the last two years have been so challenging for every one of us um, but still the people here in this call and a lot of people are there participate in the, in, in the RC3 uh, we believe that by coming together we can do something uh, good we can train something I, I i really hope that this uh, momentum continue uh, to grow um, among us and uh, inspire more people daniel your final words for yeah, the thank you <laughs> yeah, so uh yeah just just a, a quick thought that just uh, came to me uh because we've talked about uh, understanding things and i'm uh, absolutely aligned with alex here so it really helps if more and more people understand what's going on in the world to fight things like climate change, but also, well, basically any issue, right? So reading news, looking at things is always a very good idea. And since the Pocket Science Lab is uh, also open hardware, as we already discussed, uh, what you can do, for example, is you can look at the schematics that we have so that means you can get the full understanding about how the electronics are tied together and you can also transfer that to other electronics so it's not a very specific thing but lots of patterns that you see in electronics can also be found in other devices so if you are in that situation where one of your other devices breaks then maybe you can gain the knowledge to uh you know get that thing up and running back again uh, because you may see the very same pattern also being used in ps lab uh, but the core difference may be that you actually have schematics there and then maybe you can conclude and see you know uh, there are these and these devices here like you know specific resistors or capacitors uh, which have uh, special effects if they are coming together uh, or you know larger circuits like with mosfets for example 
we have many of these uh, smaller, uh, let's say, uh, compound circuits also on that board. And that can give you a very, very good understanding of things. And I can tell you, for example, with the sensors that you can attach to the PS lab, you can find the very same stuff in your laptop or in your desktop computer also. So that could be a very good motivation. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. These uh, were very good uh, final words, um, actually. And uh, thank you very much, Hom Fook, for um, all your work, also bringing the community together. Um, um, I want to point out uh, um, that we have a Code Heat contest, codeheat.org, um, where you can even like uh, uh, win some small prizes if you contribute to the Pocket Science Lab project. And um, yeah, as I said earlier, you can find us um, on pslab.io with all the links. And you can find Kiwi also like um, on his website for the Lions Forge laser cutter, um, just like type it into your favorite search engine. Thank you very much for all the panelists. It was a pleasure. Like it was really condensed. I love to get all the um, information here uh, together, and um, I hope we can meet uh, again soon as our like regular meetups that we had from time to time before uh, the Corona times. But it's great to see you all in good health, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to get the next version of um, PS Lab out there with uh, everyone's work together. And we know not everyone could be here today. Some people are like recovering. Some people are in a challenging time zone. Um, but thank you very much for your uh, work and for your contributions, everyone. And have a good day. Thanks a lot for the audience. Please connect with us and have a good time here at the RC3. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah, thank Goodbye. you very much. Uh, Thanks, take care. Have a nice day. Um...